Welcome everyone uh, to this uh, 2024 edition of the SoccerNet uh, Challenges uh, Tutorials. Uh, my name is Anthony, so I'm one of the lead organizers of the SoccerNet Challenges. And as you know, this is a big project uh, with different universities. So the University of Liège here in Belgium, uh, KAUST in Saudi Arabia, UC Louvain in Belgium, but also some companies like EVS and Baidu. And we can also count on a lot of sponsors this year uh, who are bringing prizes to those challenges. So uh, Sport Radar, uh, Quality, Sfera, and uh, NASC Science, who joined us uh, very recently. So in those challenges, how it will happen? Uh, well, what you will get uh, from it is a complete description of the data, the task, and the metrics for all the challenges, but especially we will focus on the two new challenges that we introduced this year. So you will have two short sessions for, for the previous challenges and then a uh, bit longer ones for the new ones. Of course, we will explain uh, so how the baselines work. So these are the codes that you can start with, who contain, for instance, how to load the data, uh, how to evaluate the performance of the, of the method, but also the method in itself that you can use to start uh, your uh, journey inside those challenges. Then we will have also some code demos. So really hands-on Python, um, Python uh, uh, programming uh, exercises uh, with uh, Jan and Vladimir. And we will give you also a, a bit of update on the current state of the leaderboards. So not like the exact numbers, but more or less like is the baseline already beaten or not. And this will be your chance also to ask questions and discuss. So the way this works better is if during the call, you just ask some question in the chat, and then we will answer all of the questions uh, at the end of the session, which should be uh, in about a bit more than an hour and a, and a half. Um, so don't hesitate to use the, the, the chat uh, in the Zoom call to ask all of your questions, even during the call. I will collect everything, and then I will ask a question to the team organizers who are uh, mostly here uh, today with us in the call. So a bit of general information about the challenges this year. So the 2024 edition comprises four different tasks, and uh, we will develop a bit what those tasks are about uh, in, in just a minute. But uh, importantly, these we have now seven coordinators for those tasks, which you see here on the screen, who come from the different institutions who are helping organize uh, the different challenges. So people from Sport Radar, from NAS Science, University of Liège, Calst, and uh, UC Luba. So don't hesitate to directly contact those people as well. Uh, their name will be written at the bottom of the slides whenever uh, you have a question about a specific challenge. Now, as I said this year, we have four sponsors who are offering for a total of more than $4,000 worth of money. Uh, so we'll explain a bit uh, how the, this money is divided between the different challenges, but this is great. Uh, it's a bit similar to what we had last year as well. Uh, and of course, those challenges are an opportunity for us to share with the community some open source data and some open source uh, baselines. So you can reuse those uh, for all of your research endeavors in the future. Now, importantly, the SoccerNet challenges will have a deadline of May 30, 2024, which is the last day uh, for which you can submit some results uh, to the evaluation servers. Now, I want to present a bit the team because it grew a bit bigger this year. So we uh, integrated uh, a few people uh, from uh, NASC Science, but also from UC Louvain. Uh, so, so we have, for instance, Victor, Abel Fazel, Carolina, uh, Matthews, uh, Susanna, uh, who joined uh, recently the team, and also some people from KAUST. Uh, so I'm mentioning here uh, Carlos Inorosa and, and uh, Karen Sanchez as well. Um, but SoccerNet is not just this uh, organizing team. We also have many collaborations a bit everywhere in the world now. Uh, so really happy to see that uh, our partners are uh, almost evenly spread uh, across the globe uh, at the moment, uh, both in academia and in the industry. And further, uh, much broader than this, uh, SoccerNet is not only the organizers and the participants, but also the participants of the of the challenges. And so as you can see here, like people come from basically everywhere on earth uh, to participate to these SoccerNet challenges. 
which is uh, really a great uh, success of the of of the project, I would say. So you most of you are uh, on the Discord uh, server, so we're reaching almost one thousand members now, uh, which is uh, really great, and we're looking forward to to passing this milestone. Um, you might also be aware that we have a YouTube channel where this replay will be uh, available apart from the Q&A session. So all of your questions will remain uh, between the people inside the call uh, and not uh, put on YouTube. But the rest of the presentation will be available in YouTube if you want to go back and rewatch uh, some of the parts uh, that you may miss uh, during this uh, presentation. Now, just to give you a bit of an idea of how big the SoccerNet challenges are. Over the past three years, uh, we've had more than 1,200 submissions from 134 teams in the world, which is massive. And these teams come from both academia, from uh, the industry, but also sometimes some researchers who are just willing to do this on their own, uh, outside of, uh, of their uh, company or their university. And uh, sometimes they do win. Uh, like last year, we had one person who alone won one of the challenge. So of course, it's great if you can build a team around the challenge. But even if you're alone on this, you still have your, uh, your chance. Now, let's have a look maybe a bit at the challenges that will be presented during this session and that, will be, uh, that are uh, open for 2024. So the two first challenges are actually recurring challenges from uh, last year. So we first have the ball action spotting task, which goal is to detect over time all the uh, events related to the ball that happened during a broadcast game. Next, we have the dense video captioning task uh, that you may recall as well. That is basically taking a whole broadcast video of 45 minutes and trying to anchor all the important moments and describe them with engaging comments. And now for the new task of this year, we have first the game state reconstruction task, which is basically the task of ev doing everything almost uh, in terms of understanding what's happening in, 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 inside a soccer video. <laughs> so the goal is to track all the players to um, to identify them with their jersey number, to then project everything on some kind of minimap. And Vladimir, uh, who is here today with uh, Victor and Halbol Fazel, will give you uh, a lot more detail on how to tackle this task, what uh, are the, the new evaluation metric that we had to put in place to evaluate such, such a new task. And it will give you also some uh, Python code demo that you can directly run on any of your video uh, right after this call. And finally, we have the multi-view file recognition uh, task, where we will provide you with a set of uh, videos that are filming the same action from different uh, points of view. And the goal will be to predict whether it is a file or not that is inside those clips. What is the severity of the file? So let's say giving a yellow card or giving a red card. And what is the type uh, of file? So is it a pushing? Is it a holding, for instance? So very new, uh, exciting video recognition task that we have here. And so all those challenges, the results will be presented during the CV Sports Workshop, which happens every year in CVPR. And we're glad to say that this year we were invited with Silvio to be part also of the organizing committee of the CV Sports Workshop uh, that will be happening in Seattle on June 18th. So if you're there, uh, feel free to come. Uh, we've had a record number of submissions for the uh, publications inside the workshop, but uh, this is not the only way to, 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 to be exposed uh, in that workshop. Uh, the SoccerNet Challenges will offer also the winners a chance to present their work uh, during uh, the last uh, session uh, of this uh, workshop. And so this year, we also got uh, uh, Sferia, uh, who is a company uh, in, in Italy uh, that uh, will be sponsoring uh, the best paper award uh, of the workshop with a $1,000. Uh, but this is for published papers only, so already uh, done. Now, um, for the challenges, we already have uh, three sponsors for the four uh, tasks. So for ball action putting, it will be NASC Science, who is coordinating uh, the challenge. 
but also sponsoring it with a thousand dollar prize uh, for the winner. Then we have the dense video captioning task uh, with our new uh, partners, uh, Quality, uh, who are also sponsoring uh, the challenge with a thousand dollar. And finally, uh, our long term uh, partners, uh, Sport Radar, who are uh, both organizing uh, this task of game state reconstruction and uh, and uh, providing a thousand dollar to the winners. But this is not like the only thing you can gain. Even if you're not first in the challenge, you can still uh, have some visibility of your work. So what we usually uh, do, so in 2022, 2023, we publish a paper after uh, the challenges end, so which is basically a recap paper of uh, what method worked well or what did not work well, because you can still learn from what did not work well. Um, that is basically summarizing all the different methods for the challenge. And so inside this paper, you can find, of course, the leaderboard for all of the tasks uh, of, uh, of the different uh, challenges and a summary of the different methods. So usually a one or two paragraph summary uh, provided by the authors who are willing to participate. And so, for instance, last year among the, I don't remember how many teams, more than a half of them decided to be part of that paper, which accounted for more than 104 authors for, uh, from more than 40 different uh, institutions. And so this paper is then great visibility to show that you actually participated inside in the challenge. It shows your spot also where you were inside the, the, inside the, the leaderboard. And this can be great also for PhD students who need to publish, of course. Uh, so this is like one uh, way to be uh, included inside those uh, publications. Now, to be eligible for the prize, uh, there are a few criteria. So first of all, anyone can participate, whether you're from academia, as I said, from the industry, or, um, or uh, just uh, on your own, uh, you want to participate, you're free to, to, to come. So we recommend that uh, participants form uh, a team because when you're together, you're usually stronger. And there is actually a channel on, uh, uh, yeah, a text channel on our Discord server, who, which is especially for you to find uh, different teams. Uh, so feel free to just write a message there and maybe someone who's willing to participate in the same challenge as you will let you know that uh, he's willing to, to, to be part of it with you. Um, then at the end of the submission, so as I said, uh, May 30, we will ask each team to write a technical report to be eligible for the prize. So this technical report, I will give a, a bit more information afterwards, is for us to check basically if your submission makes sense, uh, if you did not cheat, uh, for instance, to, uh, to, to achieve your results. But to be honest, this rarely happened uh, the, the, that we had to, to disqualify uh, one team uh, for, for this kind of stuff. But, um, but this is really important. If you want to be eligible for the prize, then uh, submit a technical report. And finally, the winning team is required to make a short presentation of their method. So during the CV Sports Workshop, so you don't have to be in person. If you're there, that's great. But if you're not, uh, you can also uh, just send us uh, a video and we will play it uh, in front of the audience uh, during the CV Sports Workshop. And each challenge finally has its specific rules. So make sure to check them. They're available on the different GitHubs uh, of the Socanet uh, of the Socanet uh, repositories, so feel free to just have a look there and uh, for the challenge specific rules. So regarding the technical report, uh, the deadline is actually June six, so exactly one week after the end of the submission, and you have to send it to our uh, new email address, so Socanet at uliege.be. Uh, which uh, is the address from which you receive the invitation uh, to this uh, uh, Zoom link. Uh, so exactly the same address. You just send us an email and we will send you a receipt notice. So if you don't receive that notice, maybe we haven't received your submission. So, so just uh, ping us anywhere else, so on Discord or on social media if, if there is an issue. Now, the technical report don't have to be in a paper kind of format, right? It's just short paper, uh, usually it's around two or three pages, double column that you can do. Uh, so for instance, we recommend that you use the CVPR template, which is uh, the best template that exists. 
uh, in my opinion. So just use that template, no more than two or three pages. You don't need to put uh, like intro related work, conclusion or anything, just simple description of the method. What are the parameters that you used to uh, basically for us to be able to reproduce your results uh, if we need to. Um, so that's it. Now, we don't require that you send some code because we know that for companies, it may be difficult uh, to get the approval uh, in uh, like a week. So, but if you can, uh, it's always better if we can check rather than checking with the, the technical reports, uh, if we can directly uh, run your code, see the results. Of course, it's a great way to show that uh, all transparency, uh, which is like the basis of uh, open science. Now, what, uh, what will be uh, your job and our job until the end of the challenge? Well, first, from now on until the end of May, your job is to make submissions on the Eval AI platforms. So you've seen uh, probably already uh, where, to, um, uh, where, where you need to uh, put your uh, prediction of your models uh, for the different challenges. So it's happening on Eval AI which is a submission, classic submission platform for results. And then on May 30, we will, uh, you, for, you will have one week uh, to write the technical report, as I said, uh, so until June 6. And then we'll take the next few days to actually read your reports and verify the results. So this is where we check that everything is in order, your submission is good, and we decide on the winners. Then on June 10, you will receive an email telling you what is your spot uh, in the leaderboard and if you won or not uh, the challenge. So make sure to check your email uh, by, that, by that time because if you're the winner, uh, we'll ask you, of course, uh, your uh, information to send you the money, but also like uh, ask you to, um, to prepare a small presentation, which is usually between uh, one and two uh, minutes uh, that we will um, show during the workshop. And then on June 18, there will be the CV Sports Workshop and your work will be uh, advertised there. So usually we show uh, the three, uh, the top three teams uh, and we uh, describe or show a description video of the winning team solution. And if you're there during CVPR, uh, all of our team almost uh, will also be attending the conference in Seattle. So we'll be there from uh, June 17 to June 21, so make sure to uh, come say hi. So this is for the uh, practical organization of the challenges this year, which is very similar to what we did the previous years. And now we will move on to uh, the description of the different tasks. So I will uh, first give you uh, the, 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 a small presentation of the first two tasks, which are basically the same than last year. So it will be very short uh, for those two. And if you need more uh, information uh, on those, feel free to go check out the tutorial of last year where it was explained in more uh, details. And otherwise, don't hesitate to ask questions in the chat and we can uh, answer your questions uh, after, right after the, the, the presentation of the four tasks. So let's start with the first task, ball action spotting. Uh, which is organized and sponsored uh, by NASC Science. So as I told you, in this task, you will have to precisely locate when and which soccer actions occur. And those actions are only the one related to the ball that we're interested in. So the data consists of a few broadcast games, so much less than the original SoccerNet data set, only nine broadcast game in this case, which are annotated with a single timestamp for all the actions that uh, we need to uh, uh, localize. So this year, uh, we have 12 different events, which is a bit new from uh, what was presented last year. So last year, we only had passes and drive events. And this year, we uh, added uh, much more uh, annotations to it, like if it's a cross, a ball player block and all different kinds of uh, actions that can happen to the ball. So between 12 different events. And this uh, task, uh, th this new data actually comes from one of our partner uh, from France, which is uh, Foot en Vision. So we thank them uh, for providing us with those uh, annotations as well. And from a research perspective, what is really interesting in this task compared to the 
action spotting task uh, uh, that we've been running for the past three years is that we actually have only a very low limited amount of data representing those actions with the ball. So the question is, how can we overcome this low amount of data? So for instance, last year, uh, some participants used some self-supervised or uh, transfer learning from the SoccerNet 500 games uh, that is available and that you can use to actually improve uh, on uh, the results of for this uh, uh, data. So make sure to explore uh, those kind of techniques. Uh, they worked well last year and uh, probably will work well also uh, in the coming years. So to help you get started, uh, we are uh, also uh, proposing a baseline, which is actually uh, the winner of last year. So uh, Ruslan Baikulov, uh, who uh, proposed this uh, method and won by himself uh, the, the challenge last year. So we took his method and retrained it on the 12 uh, actions instead of the two that he did uh, the previous year. And so you can see the architecture here, uh, which is basically a multi-stage uh, training uh, of uh, image encoders and then uh, more video uh, encoders and using slow fusion uh, mechanisms. So make sure to go check his uh, GitHub uh, that I put a link to uh, uh, at the bottom. Uh, it's also available directly as a link uh, via our Socknet GitHub. Um, so you can de definitely use that as a starting point. Go check what he did. Uh, there are some really pretty neat ideas uh, in there. And, uh, and uh, this will help you uh, get started with the challenge. Now, for the second task, dense video captioning. Here, uh, the goal is really to um, generate captions describing soccer actions uh, and to localize each caption by a single timestamp. So what this means is that we provide you 45 minute video and you have to uh, look for all the important uh, moments within the soccer game that could be um, that could uh, lead to an interesting and engaging comment and then to generate that comment. All right. And so here uh, we ask you, for instance, uh, to to to, to provide a comment similar to, oh, this player plays a terrific cross over to this other player who finds some space inside the box and puts the ball into the back of the net. Um, now, for this year, we're also not, um, we're also not uh, imposing that you are providing the name of the players because this is a very difficult task, right? So you can use a token uh, that represents players. So for instance, here, uh, this uh, token uh, player, same for the teams, uh, the team names. Um, the data uh, is the same as last year. So comprised of 471 broadcast game uh, and 36,000 captions uh, inside. So very big data set. Uh, completely different from the previous task where we were working with a few data. Here, uh, you have everything to train basically any type of large language model or, um, or, uh, or other uh, video uh, language uh, architectures. So just uh, go check a bit what was done last year inside our paper, SoccerNet 2023 challenge results, uh, and, and uh, look for what the different participants did uh, last year and try to improve on that score. So for the baseline, uh, we're keeping the one uh, that we also had last year. So it's a two-stage approach where we first localize uh, when to generate a caption, and then we take a clip around that those times and uh, generate a caption. So you can still reuse uh, that code um, uh, to, uh, to start uh, your uh, challenge journey. Now, as a last thing uh, about this uh, second task is the metric. So you can have uh, much more detail inside our paper, but uh, just to give you an idea of how it works. So basically, uh, we are building uh, windows around each ground truth caption. And if one of your predictions falls within that, um, uh, that uh, window, we say, OK, it is a correct spot for a caption. And then we look at the similarity of the caption uh, between the ground truth and what you generated. And we use some classic uh, metric like uh, Meteor, uh, who you might, which uh, you might be familiar with um, to uh, evaluate 
uh, the performance of uh, the of of your uh, model. And uh, yeah, so that's it for the first two tasks. As I said, those I went very quickly over uh, because these are uh, these are um, the same then from last year. So if you want, just go have a look at uh, the previous year's uh, tutorial or uh, ask any question uh, in the chat. Now I will uh, give the floor uh, to Vladimir, uh, who will be presenting the game state uh, reconstruction task uh, that is brand new from this year. So it will be a bit longer uh, description of everything and then uh, some demo code. So Vladimir, if you're ready, uh, I will uh, stop sharing and you can uh, start sharing your, uh, your screen as well. Great, thank you. Okay, can you see my screen? Great. Yes. So hello everyone, thank you, Anthony. So welcome to the SoccerNet Game State Reconstruction Tutorial. Um, so in this presentation, um, we will provide an overview of the Game State Reconstruction Challenge, uh, including the task, the data set, the input and output to the task, the evaluation metric, and finally the baseline. However, this is only a brief overview uh, of all of this, and we will start as quickly as possible with the code-based live demo. So if you want to have more information about the task and the challenge, please have a look at our GitHub repository. And just to let you know, um, our paper was accepted to CV Sport at, CV, at CVPR, and we will release it on archive uh, in a few days. So please have a look at the paper if you need more information about uh, the data set, the metric, or the baseline. So um, game state reconstruction, or simply GSR, um, is a, a task that involves identifying and localizing all athletes in a real-world uh, coordinate system. And so, GSR can be seen actually as a compression task where the goal is to extract high level information about a sport game uh, given uh, a raw input video. And in our case, that high level information uh, include the 2D position of all athletes on the pitch, uh, their role, for instance, player, goalkeeper, referee, etc. And of course, for the players, their jersey number and their team affiliation. So by team affiliation, we mean in this case, um, if the player belongs to, to the left or the right team with respect to the camera viewpoint. Um, and so in this presentation and um, in our work, we refer to uh, all the person to be tracked as athletes. So this includes the players and the referee. Um, so as you can see on the slide, uh, this high-level information that we extract can be nicely displayed as a 2D minimap. Um, and you can see here on the left that uh, the left minimap are the predictions from our GSR pipeline. And the minimap on the right are the ground truth information, so the annotation from the dataset. Um, and so game state reconstruction is a quite challenging task. Um, because it requires to solve many subtasks. Uh, and these subtasks include, for instance, pitch localization, camera calibration, person detection, re-identification, and tracking, but also jersey number recognition and team affiliation. And so we will see later, but actually these tasks, uh, they are strongly dependent. And so failing to solve one of the tasks will result in failing to solve the entire GSR task. So with our um, proposed SoccerNet GSR dataset, um, we actually introduced a first benchmark for uh, this game state reconstruction task. And so the SoccerNet GSR dataset is built on top of the SoccerNet tracking dataset uh, for multi-object tracking that was introduced um, two or three years ago, I believe. And what we did is to add new annotations uh, to that data set. 
And so the new annotation that we added are annotation for pitch lines, for pitch localization. And what we did is to apply a state-of-the-art uh, camera calibration method on top of these manual pitch uh, lines annotation to compute the, the position of the players on the pitch. And so, as you can see, as you can see, uh, the data set is quite big. So we have 200 clips of 30 seconds each. And these, split, these um, uh, clips are split into four sets. So a train, a valid, and a test set. And finally, a challenge set with secret annotation that we use to rank your methods. Um, so we made some design choices for this first version uh, of the data set. So for instance, uh, you should not track the ball and the player that go out of the camera view should not be tracked anymore. So here is an overview of the inputs and output to the task. So as you can see, the input to the task is a continuous 30 second video from a broadcast feed um, with no cut. So this means that uh, the video comes from a moving camera where all the athletes uh, are not always visible. Um, and the output to the task is uh, simply a JSON file, uh, a JSON file for the uh, for the video. Um, and that JSON file contains a list of the predicted detections. And so a detection <clears throat> is simply a dictionary that includes a few important information. Uh, for instance, we have the image ID, uh, the track ID that is produced by the multi-object tracking module, um, a B-box pitch field that contains uh, the image bounding box uh, that has been projected on the pitch. Um, and so the 2D position of the player on the pitch actually corresponds to the bottom center part of the bounding box uh, that has been projected on that field. So here we make the assumption that uh, the player uh, has his feet on the ground. Um, we also ask to output a confidence score for the bonding box. Um, it is required by the evaluation library, but you can simply set that one to one. And finally, we have all the three attributes that are provided, including the role, uh, the jersey number, and the team. And in that case, if the jersey number is not visible, or the, the athlete is not a player, um, you can simply set the jersey number or the team to the null value. Um, so if you look at the example prediction file that we provide on the GitHub, so the link is uh, below on the slide, um, you will see that there are, there are more fields uh, in the predictions, but these fields are ignored for now. So uh, yeah please just have a look at the field that you see here on the slide. So here is an overview of uh, the GS OTA metric that we introduce. Um, so here I will try to give you an intuition of how that metric works, but if you need more details, please have a look at the GitHub or the paper. So this GS OTA, GS OTA metric is derived from the OTA metric for multi-object tracking. So HOTA stands for uh, Higher Order Tracking Accuracy. And so there is a key difference between HOTA and GSOTA. And this is the similarity score that is used to match the prediction with the ground truth. So with the classic HOTA, the author introduced simply an IOU score as a similarity score to match the prediction and the ground truth. But in our case, we employ another similarity score. And so um, actually, this is a combination of two similarity metrics. We have the localization similarity, or simply LOCSIM, and the identity similarity, so IDC, IDSIM um, on the slide. And so the localization similarity will simply turn the Euclidean distance on the pitch between the prediction and the ground rules into a similarity score by using a Gaussian kernel. So the resulting similarity score will have a value in between 0 and 1. And so in a nutshell, uh, a distance of 0 meters on the pitch between the prediction and the ground rules 
will result in a similarity of one and a distance um, of more than five meters between the prediction and the ground truth will result in a similarity score that is close to zero. Um, and so the identity similarity is very simple. Um, it will be simply set to one if all the attributes match. So this means that the similarity will be set to one if the prediction and the ground truth have the same role, the same jersey, and the same uh, team. So overall, um, this GSOTA similarity score is very strict because if your prediction is too far away from the ground truth on the pitch, or you made one mistake on the role, the team, or, or the jersey number, then the prediction will be considered as incorrect. It will be considered as a false positive. And so that prediction will negatively impact the GS OTA score. And so if you are interested, we have a more detailed discussion about this very strict constraint in the paper. So let's have a look at the baseline. Um, so the baseline that we propose in our GitHub is a combination of several state-of-the-art methods. Um, and only two of these methods are actually fine-tuned on soccer data. Um, so first of all, the tracking is performed in the image space. So what we do is first to apply the Euro V8 object detector to produce uh, detections. And then these detections are forwarded to uh, three subsequent modules. So we have, first of all, the jersey number recognition module. Here we simply employ MMOCR. Then we have the re-identification module. So here we employ PRT re-ID. So PRT re-ID is a, a re-identification method that is uh, designed especially for team sport. So it has been trained with a re-identification, team affiliation, and role classification objectives at training. And it produces embeddings uh, that are discriminative in terms of team, in terms of identity, and in terms of role. And so these embeddings are then sent to three um, other modules. So the first module is the role classification module. So here what we do, is simply to apply a classifier to uh, turn that embedding into one of the four possible classes. So those classes are simply goalkeeper, player, referee, and other. Then we have the tracking module. So here we simply employ the strong sort uh, algorithm for multi-object tracking. And so that module will uh, merge the track the uh, detections into tracklet by tagging each uh, detection with a track id and finally we have the team affiliation module um, so for that team affiliation module we first compute one embedding per tracklet by averaging all the embedding um, from the detection that belong to the same tracklet so as a result we have only one embedding per tracklet then we will apply a uh, k-min clustering to cluster all those tracklet embedding into two groups. And then for each group, we will compute, compute the average position on the pitch. And um, thanks to that average position, we will be able to tell which cluster correspond to the left team and which cluster correspond to the right team. Um, then we have two important modules that are the tracklet consistency module. So for role classification and jersey number recognition, we apply these on the detection. And therefore, we need a way to turn these detection level predictions into tracklet level prediction. And to do that, we simply apply a majority voting scheme along the tracklet to have one role and one jersey number per tracklet. Um, finally, um, another branch is responsible for pitch localization to obtain the pitch lines, uh, camera calibration uh, that uses those pitch lines to uh, obtain the camera parameters. And finally, we use these camera parameters to turn the bounding boxes into 2D positions on the pitch. 
Um, and so you can see as a result, the output of the baseline is a set of tracklets with their position on the ground, um, the teams, the role, and the jersey numbers. And uh, overall, uh, please bear in mind that this uh, baseline is offline because of the tracklet consistency module and the team affiliation module. So that was it for the baseline. Um, now we will move on to the um, uh, live demo for the code base. Um, I will leave the floor to Victor for that. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you want do you want to uh, use my my screen to explain that slide? Okay, okay. Um, so before we go to the ah, you see myself twice. Um, before we go um, to the live demo, uh, I would like to um, first give you a a brief overview of um, the baseline and its framework. Um, and so basically, um, we use um, Track Lab as a <laughs> we use Track Lab as a baseline for uh, the SN Game States repository, and uh, Track Lab is built on uh, three main libraries, uh, mainly Pandas, uh, PyTorch, and PyTorch Lightning, and Hydra. Um, and uh, those three libraries allow us to. Um, build uh, modules and utilities um, with track lab and then on top of those um, modules that are uh, soccer nets uh, game state reconstruction specific like pitch localization like camera calibration like jersey number recognition uh, but now uh, i'll try to share my screen um, and show you um, some live demo Do you still hear me? Perfect. So um, I'll go ahead and show you uh, basically three things. Uh, first, uh, installing um, the baseline, then running it, and finally, um, I'm going to show you how to modify the baseline um, in order to uh, add your own improvements. And so um, basically, um, the first thing uh, you have to do if you want to um, install the baseline is look at the SM Game State repository and go find the um, quick installation guide. And I'm going to show you a brief um, demo of this quick installation guide. Like you see, I already created a SoccerNet um, directory, and I'm in it. And so firstly, I have to, um, to do two Git clones, uh, like I'm doing now. And then I'm going to show you um, option one of installing using Poetry. Um, Poetry is a kind of uh, dependency management solution for Python. Um, I already have it installed. Um, and so I can run um, inside the SM game states um, directory. I can run poetry install. Um, and like that, um, I'll have uh, all the necessary um, dependencies for uh, the SN game state repository. So poetry install, poetry run, and then poetry shell. Um, when I'm running poetry shell, this will create a new shell, um, which uh, will enable me to run the track lab command. And so this was just an example. Um, what I'm really going to do um, is show you um, the one where I already have everything installed uh, because it would take a long time to uh, install all the dependencies, especially Torch takes a long time to install. Um, and so uh, the first thing you might want to do um, when everything is installed is to run uh, Track Lab itself. Um, 
the uh, track lab commands for uh, the game state reconstruction challenge is uh, track lab uh, minus cn soccer net. Um, and if I try to run this, um, it's going to start and um, it's going to ask me uh, if I want to download the data sets automatically. Right now, I don't want to do this. Um, as last time, it's going to take a long time, so I'm going to say no. And of course, um, that doesn't work. And so what I want to do um, is I want to tell uh, Track Lab that I already have uh, the training data and uh, the models installed somewhere else. Um, and how can I do this? Well, let's look at the help that I need. And so here, the Track Lab help provides um, two different things. Um, at the very top, um, you have what uh, is called in, in Hydra uh, configuration groups. And the configuration groups allow you to choose, for example, a data set. Uh, Track Lab uh, proposes a bunch of data sets. And here, it's Soconet GS that is interesting to us. But because I tell him that I'm running um, for the uh, Soconet challenge, um, this is already taken care of. What I have to do, however, is change the parts. And so I have to change either the data deer or the model deer, which are um, for the data where I have the Soconet game states present and uh, for the pre tamed models for the model deer. There are two ways to do this. Um, I'm going to first show you um, the command line way, uh, which is basically simple, simply data deer equals here, for example, uh, uh, slash data. Um, and there's also um, the uh, file way. And for the file way, I'm going to uh, go to the um, PyCharm IDE. Um, and here, uh, you'll have to look for inside the SM game states directory, inside the SM game state directory, inside configs. Um, there's a, a very important file called soccernet.yaml. And inside this file, um, we've provided all the um, keys and values that you would uh, possibly uh, like to change. And so the first um, big dictionary is the default dictionary, which contains a list of um, all the defaults. And that's here that we say that Socknet uh, game state is the default data set that we want to use. And so here I want to change uh, the data deer and the model deer. I've already done this. Um, and let me show you what I changed. And so I changed the data deer and model deer. And so I can uh, simply rerun the track lab uh, command. And I hope we'll go a bit um, further. And like you see here, uh, we're able to load um, the Soconet uh, videos for all the four um, data set, uh, sets. Um, and Track Lab tries to run. And of course, uh, as you can see, um, I'm on my laptop. And so, um, the defaults that we provided, um, the defaults for the batch sizes uh, that we provided are um, too big to run on my laptop. And so I'm going to have to um, change those defaults. And in the same way that I changed the data deer and the model deer, um, I can um, change for each module the batch size uh, that I want. And so here, instead of a batch size of eight for the B-box detector, I changed it to two. 
Um, same for the uh, pose estimator that we don't use. Um, and same for all the different uh, modules. In the same um, uh, time, I put the number of frames um, that we're going to um, use at 30. And so right now, we're going to have a look at one video and 30, the first 30 frames of that video. And so let me run it again. And we'll see that after it has initialized uh, everything, uh, we'll be able to um, run the YOLO V8 um, baseline. And this doesn't work because Zoom takes a bunch of my memory already. And so I'm going to show you um, what the results should be. Um, and so, um, this is one of the important things. So in the um, SN game state repo repository, um, once you have run the uh, track clap code, it will create an outputs um, uh, directory. Inside this outputs directory, um, you will have a bunch of um, directories by default, only uh, SN game states. Um, and when you look at this, uh, you will see first um, the dates and then um, the hour and each experiment, each time that you run track lab, it's going to create a new directory and it will run all the code inside that specific directory. And so um, the first thing um, that might be interesting to you is to go look at the configurations. This is the same as um, what I showed you uh, with the track lab help. It's basically um, all the configuration that was used to run this code. This is interesting if you want to um, uh, reload um, a specific configuration because you had a good run for this one. Um, and I'll show you afterwards a few things that you can do, for example, to research um, using Hydra. But what's uh, really interesting is both visualization and evaluation. And visualization, you can see that for the video that uh, we ran, uh, it created a visualization. Um, and it's basically uh, the same as what Vladimir showed you, where you have on the left the predictions, um, which are quite noisy due to a lot of calibration error, uh, and on the right, the grand truth. And next to that, you have the evaluation. The first uh, way that you can see um, the results that you got um, using uh, your method is to go look at the main.log. And here, um, on the third to last line, you will see um, the information of the performance of the GS OTA, which is in this case for this one video, 11.28%, uh, which isn't great. Um, and basically, once you have this, you can also look at the evaluation results, where um, inside uh, this directory, you have a bunch more results uh, that can be interesting in order to look at uh, some specific uh, components of the GS OTA. Uh, that can be uh, interesting to you. Um, and on the other hand, you have here the predictions. Those are your predictions. And uh, inside this uh, socknet gs valid.zip, uh, which in the case of the challenge set will call, is going to be called socknet gs challenge.zip. Inside this um, zip file, you have a um, correct uh, zip file that you can send for evaluation on EvalAI. And so um, this is exactly the same as uh, this file. Um, and I can show you what it look like, looks like. 
Um, but it's basically exactly the same as what Vladimir showed you, uh, basically a bunch of uh, predictions um, with um, the beatbox pitch, uh, the attributes. Um, and if you want, you can also uh, give the uh, beatbox in the image space. Um, but it's not something that we take into account for the uh, standard metric that we use. Okay, so now that you've changed, um, that you were able to run um, the baseline, um, you might want to um, first um, adapt it to run it on the challenge sets. And for this, you only have to change um, two values, or two or three. Um, first, you have to set the number of videos uh, that you want to track on from one to minus one to um, track on the whole uh, channel sets. The number of frames, if you have set it, it's not set by default to minus one uh, also, and then set the eval set to challenge. This will run on the challenge set. And one thing that you might want to do uh, for uh, performance purposes is to set save videos to false. Um, if you don't want to see the videos, uh, if you don't want to visualize uh, the tracking, um, because it will run a bit faster if you don't visualize. Um, and so that's basically it. That's how we ran the baseline. Um, but I hope that what you would like to do uh, is get better results uh, than the baseline. And so I'm going to show you um, first a few tricks that might help you um, speed up tracking. Um, and then I'm going to show you how to uh, create a new uh, team clustering algorithm, um, which in my case performs uh, less well than the baseline. Uh, but I hope that you'll be able to find uh, a better method. And so uh, what I didn't show you um, when looking at the, the outputs um, is that there is a directory called the states directory. And inside this uh, states directory, um, you have what I call a pickle zip file. Um, and this uh, pickle zip file is basically a zip file uh, that contains um, Python pickles um, for the data frames uh, that we use for um, the tracking. And so basically it contains all the information from one prediction in uh, a format that you can uh, use and, and reload inside um, a inside a new run of TrackLab. And so I have uh, here um, the complete pickle zip file for the test sets. Um, and so what I'm going to do is show you um, how to use this to speed up your tracking um, in the case that uh, you only want to work on a specific um, module. And so the first thing you have to change um, is to set the load file to your specific um, tracker states, uh, pickle zip. Uh, once you do that, uh, it will use um, the columns that are provided inside this load file um, in order to um, not do part of the pipeline that you would otherwise have to do. And so um, in the definition of the pipeline where previously Previously, you had the B-box detector, the re-ID module, the tracking module, uh, the pitch line um, detection, the calibration module, jersey number detection, and, and track lead aggregation. Now, because I want to focus only on uh, team clustering, and so saying which team is left and which team is right, um, I only um, keep the two last ones which is the team clustering and then the team affiliation. Here, we only, with the, the team um, clustering, we only say which player is in each unknown team. And then when we do um, T 
team side affiliation, uh, what we're going to do is uh, give this right and left label. Um, and so right now I have this um, much faster pipeline that I can run. And I can simply rerun uh, the track app commands. And once all the data set has been loaded, which might take a few seconds, um, we'll see um, the power of um, the tracker state um, because team clustering doesn't take a lot of um, power. And so we're able to uh, run the full pipeline or at least the part that is of interest to us um, very quickly. And so um, let us maybe while it's running, look at what that, um, what the code actually is for um, team clustering. And so um, in the SM game state directory, there's a team directory where there's both clustering and side labeling. Um, what is of interest to me now is the um, team clustering module. And so this um, team clustering uh, module is a video level module. And inside Track Lab, there are basically three kinds of module. There's the, the image level module, which only runs on images. There's the detection level module, which once uh, you have, for example, um, detections that were created by uh, a bounding box detector, uh, you can run on an algorithm, for example, re-identification on each specific um, uh, detection. And then there's this one, the video level module, where you get all the images from, from a video and all the detections. And this can be used, for example, for um, team clustering, where basically, um, we create um, from the re-ID embeddings, um, we try to um, cluster them using k-means. And so this gives relatively good results, but um, what I want to uh, see is if I can find a better clustering algorithm, um, because someone told me that, that k-means is old, um, and that the new um, HDB scan is much more improved and, and much better. And so that's um, basically what I'm going to try to do. Um, I'm going to try um, to create a new uh, module that is um, using HDB scan, which is a density-based clustering algorithm, but that's not important right now. Um, what is important is uh, what are the files that you want to that you have to add if you want to create a new module? And so let us look at um, this last um, commit, where basically I created um, the HDB scan embeddings. So, um, code where I switched from k-means to uh, HDB scan, and then um, I wrote a lot of uh, a bunch of codes because um, density-based clustering algorithms um, don't ask for the number of clusters, but um, find the number of clusters themselves. But here in this case, that's not a good idea. And so I have to do a bunch of coding for this to work. And so I've created this new uh, class. It's also a video level module. I've named it Tracklet Team HDB Scan Clustering. Um, and um, when I create uh, one of these classes, I always have to create um, a new uh, configuration for this class. And here you see it as uh, HDB Scan Embeddings, where basically the target is the new class I have created. Um, and so 
here I've, of course, uh, put this code inside the SM game states um, package. But if you have your own package that you would like to change, um, as long as Python can find it, um, you can use it. And so this uh, target value can be anything you want, as long as um, you could do an import of it in any file that you want. And then um, you can have additional um, options, additional configuration, and all these configuration are then given um, to the initialization um, methods of the class. And so I've created a new configuration. I've <coughs> created the code, and now I have to use it. And to use it, I go again to the SoccerNet YAML file. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and I go um, what you? and change um, what are you doing? and things to HDB scan and the things. And like before, um, I could also have done it um, by changing uh, this key. And so I can write it like this, module team equals HDB scan clustering. Both work. And so when I um, use this group, this is a, in Hydra uh, speak, this is a group. When I use this group, I can also um, go and change, um, how did I call it? The min cluster size. Min cluster size, for example. Um, but because um, these values are here by default, I can simply run this value again. Um, and while it runs, um, we can maybe have a look at um, the performance of the baseline on the test set, where we have a GSOTA of 20.4%, um, which is not great, um, but which leaves you a lot of um, room for improvements, um, and that there are a lot of things you can do. Um, one of the things that we saw um, was that um, since we didn't train a jersey number recognition model, uh, we simply used an OCR module. Um, that is one of the areas that we were heavily penalized. And so um, right now, um, we're running the new uh, HDB scan uh, API, oh. the new HDB scan module. And as you see, uh, we're going to have uh, some results with this. And so one thing that might be um, important to know is that there are some modules that are uh, defined directly in SN game states, um, jersey number recognition, calibration, etc. But there are some modules that are um, defined directly in TrackLab. And so um, some of these modules uh, might be of interest to you. Uh, the VBOX detector, uh, if you want to use a pose estimation module, um, if you want to have a new uh, tracking algorithm, all these modules are already defined in TrackLab. And you don't have to um, modify them in track lab. You can modify them in uh, SM game state if you want. Um, but it can be interesting to you to go and look at uh, which B-box detector we used. And for that, uh, you have to go look at the track lab code. And so um, we've uh, run the tracking um, and we have started evaluation. Um, but I think I'll leave you um, here before the evaluation finishes, uh, because it's going to still take a long time. And so thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, and I give the floor to uh, Jan for the multi-view file recognition challenge. Perfect. Thank you very much. 
can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Let me share my screen. Um... Can you see my screen? Yes, yes absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we can see. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Uh, so my name is Jan Held. I'm a PhD student at the University of Liège in uh, Belgium. I'm also a football referee. So this task is uh, very personal and very special for me because it's what I'm doing every weekend. Uh, I don't know if maybe some of you guys have uh, watched yesterday the Champions League game of uh, Arsenal against Bayern Munich, where we had in the last minute a very difficult penalty situation where uh, the goalkeeper of uh, Bayern Munich touched the attack of Arsenal and the referee had to decide is it a penalty or not. And in this uh, case, he decided it's not a penalty. And this is, a, uh, and this is exactly what our task is about. It's building a first AI referee, which is able to determine if it is a foul or not, the severity of the foul and the type of foul. And we have in total more than 4,000 multi-view uh, actions um, where we have some actions, uh, is it a foul or not? And uh, for each uh, action, we have two, three or four different perspectives uh, from which we can see the action. Uh, in total, we have two tasks that you have to, de uh, to determine uh, for this challenge, which is, first of all, uh, the offense and severity, and second of all, the type of action. And what you have to build is this black box or this model in between, which gets us input multiple views of the same action, and you have to determine if it is a foul or not, and the severity and the type of action. Let's have a look at the two tasks in more detail. So first of all, the offense and severity, as I said, it's determined if it is a foul or not, and the severity, we have four classes, no foul, foul and no card, foul and a yellow card, and foul and a red card. And I know that the challenge is not that easy because very often it's very subjective to determine if it's a foul or not, uh, or if it's a yellow card or red card, and very often it's very based on a uh, personal opinion. And therefore, I don't think that's possible to get 100% accuracy because it's just too difficult. It's not like determining if it's a cat or a dog. Uh, it's much more difficult, but I think that you can still get uh, a very good model who is able to determine in most of the cases the correct uh, decision. The second task is already a little bit easier. It's determining the type of action. Here we have eight different uh, classes. We have a tackle, which is like a sliding tackle. Standing tackling, it's all of the foot fouls, like um, uh, stepping on foot or just touching someone on the shin or on the foot. Uh, then we have holding, pushing, high leg. I think they are self-explaining. Then dive is a simulation where an attacker tries to deceive the referee uh, to get a free kick or a penalty, even though there was no contact. So he just falls down to get uh, an advantage. And we have challenge, which, which is a shoulder uh, action where the defender maybe pushes the attacker with the shoulder in the back or against the shoulder. The elbowing, it's kicking someone with the elbow in the face, in the head or against the body. And those are the eight challenges or the, the eight class that we have, have for the second task. For the data, uh, most of the cases we have two views, but for a lot of um, uh, actions, we also have three or four views, uh, but it's most of the time between two and four. So we have do not have more than four different views. And the first view is always the one that we can see uh, if we watch a game at the television. It's the broadcast view, which is from far away, which is most of the cases not so useful because it's just too far away and it's very difficult to determine if there's any contact or not. For example, if we look here at the view one, uh, the image in the middle, it's pretty impossible to determine if there's any contact or not. The views are most of the time uh, time aligned, meaning that if we look at the uh, frame 20 of view 1 and view 2, it should uh, be captured at the same moment. It's not always at the same uh, time because we had to time align them manually, so I had to do it by hand. Uh, so it's not very uh, or it's not 100% uh, accurate, but most of the time it's uh, pretty much at the same time. 
Furthermore, the videos are five seconds long and the foul occurs most of the time at frame 75. So we have 25 frames per second and at the third second or at the frame 75, we have the point of contact. Um, and as you can see, for example, frame zero where we start, there's not much yet to see if it's a foul or not. The same for the frame 125, the, the, the foul already happened. So what we did in our baseline, we just took uh, or we just extracted the one second where the foul happened. So we took uh, the frames between frame 63 and the frame 87 to just give to the model the foul itself. Uh, for future research, it can definitely be very interesting to see if we give more context to the model, if the performance is better. However, if you start with this challenge, I would recommend to just give at the beginning the foul itself to the model and just uh, take the frames where you can really see uh, the action. Because otherwise, it's a, it's a computational, very complex if you give the 125 frames and then you have also two views. You just give too much uh, data to the model and it just takes a long time to do the computation. Uh, now I will give you a small overview of the baseline. So what we did was we took a uh, feature extractor. So the, it's four times the same one, okay? So it's four times the same feature extractor. So we do not have a, a feature extractor for each view, but it's one for all the different views. And we just push each uh, perspective through the feature extractor to get a uh, feature vector. Um, we tested multiple feature extractor. We tested some who only extract spatial features, and we tested some who extract spatial and temporal features. And we found out that the best performance was obtained by extracting spatial temporal features. I think because if you have, for example, a tackling, it's very important to know the speed of the tackle, and therefore it's important to know. Uh, also the temporal um, features. Uh, I think in our baseline, we use the MVIT model, uh, the multi-scale vision transformer, which is one of the state of the art for uh, extracting features from videos. And, um, and yes, when we have extracted the spatial temporal features from each perspective, we have to put them somehow together to get a single representation of all the videos. Uh, which was done by our aggregation layer. So we tested three different uh, methods. So the two first one are max and mean pooling, where we just uh, take the feature vectors of the different views and we max or mean pool them to get the, the final uh, single multi-view representation vector. However, the main issue with these two uh, setups is that even if a view has no information at all, it, uh, we use the same amount of information from that view than from the other views. For example, here the view on the top, it's very difficult to get any information from it, but by using max and mean pooling, we get the same amount of information from that view than from the other three views. Uh, therefore, we uh, implemented an attention pooling where we want to combine information in such a way that the views which are more important uh, give more information to the final solution. So we calculate an attention score for each view, which just means how important this view uh, is. So we compare the different views together and then we give them a score from zero to one. For example, in this example, the uh, view uh, on the top just got an attention score from 0 0.05, which just means that it does not offer or it does not give much information to the final solution. At the end, if we have this uh, final multi-view representation of all the videos, we push them through two classification heads. The first classification head, it tells us um, the type of, of action. And the second one, it determines if it's a foul or not at severity. During training, we combine both losses. So we sum them together and we try to decrease the loss of both tasks. We uh, train them both at the same time because we found out that the performance is just better if we do the training on both tasks uh, at the same time because they are somehow uh, related. For example, uh, if the model knows that it, that it is a tackling, the chances are higher that it is a yellow card, as for example, for uh, a pushing foul. So in our case, training both together, uh, we got much better results. However, if you think that two models uh, independently work better, you can definitely do it um, uh, for the challenge. But in our, um, in, our, uh, in our opinion, it works better if you do the both at the same time. 
For the metric, we use the balanced accuracy. So we do not use the, the normal accuracy because the data set is quite unbalanced. Uh, for example, during games, you have very often a foul and no card and much less fouls and red card. Therefore, if we use the accuracy and your model always predicts uh, a foul and no card, the accuracy would be very high, which is, however, not what we want because your model never predicts a yellow card and never predicts a red card. Therefore, we calculate the balanced accuracy, which calculates the accuracy for each class um, and then takes the sum or the mean of them together. For example, in the case when your model always predicts um, a foul and no card, this two positive, let's say we have a data set of 100 uh, examples and your model says 100 times it's a foul and no card. Then the true positive would be uh, exactly the same as the, the number of, um, of fouls and no cards in your data set because you predicted it always. So you have here a score of one. For the other three classes, for no foul, foul and yellow card and foul and red card, it would be every time zero because you always because you never predicted it. So the sum would be one. If you divide it by the four classes that we have, you have a, a balanced accuracy of 0 0.25, which now shows that the model is not that good at all if you always predict the same class. At the end, for the leaderboard, we sum the, the balanced accuracy of the foul and severity task and the balanced accuracy of the type of action class together, and we divide it by two to get the final representation of how good your model is on both tasks uh, at the same time. Some tips and tricks uh, that I learned uh, when I worked on the challenge was, uh, first of all, for the data set, it's not the biggest data set and it's very unbalanced. So we did a lot of data augmentation, for example, uh, just rotating <coughs> the video clips a little bit uh, or uh, just changing colors a little bit to just uh, artificially augment the data set. What you can also do is, oh, and what we did uh, during training is, uh, as I said, we use the frames 63 to 87, and during training, we temporarily shift the frames a little bit to the left. So sometimes we start at frame 60 and go to frame 84. Sometimes we start at frame 65 and we go to frame 90. So we shift them a little bit to the left and to the right to always get some uh, slightly different clips to the model to just uh, artificially augment the data. I also would recommend to use a weighted loss to just put more attention on the labels which are underrepresented in the data set. Otherwise, the chances are high that your model will always predict the class which is the most uh, in the data set. I also would use some weight decay to just uh, avoid uh, overfitting. Uh, for the results, uh, if your model performs very good on the test set, it does not necessarily mean that it does uh, also perform very good on the challenge set. So I would not overfit too much on the data set and look too much on the data set, because if you plot uh, the accuracy at each epoch on a test set and you just choose on the test set, or you just choose the weights or the epoch uh, on the test set, which works the best, does not necessarily mean it is it also works the best on the challenge set. I would really look where the model works the best on the validation set and see, and and only use the test set to, to see if the model really works good. Uh, for the training, as I said, I would use uh, the argument start frame and end frame. I will show it in, your co uh, in the code in a second to just uh, at the beginning use uh, only the frames where we can actually see the action just to reduce some uh, computational complexity. Okay, let me now show you uh, some code. So all the stuff is uh, on our GitHub. Um, if you scroll down, here are all the information to download uh, the SoccerNet pip package to get the password for the data. You just have to run this here to download the videos and all the data. If you want the, the data in a better quality, you can use the version is equal to 720p to, get, to just get the data in a higher quality. Uh, and then something I have to add uh, on the on the readme is that if you have downloaded the data set, you have to unzip the data. Okay, so the, the test set, the training set validation and the challenge set are all uh, in a zip format and you have to unzip it to uh, do the training and the testing. Um, if you uh, clone our, repo, uh, our GitHub, you get the following. If you go inside the VAS model, you have all this here. I can show you here. Oops. 
let's move this. Okay, if you go all the way down, you have here all the arguments that you can put. Uh, have a look at them. Uh, some of them can be maybe interesting for your work. Um, here, the path, it's the path to your data set. Um, if you download data set, you get something like this. If you unzip um, the folders you have here, then the training set with all the actions. And what you have to give in the past is the folder data set here. So you do not give the, the past to the training set, but to the data set where you have saved these four folders. Okay, uh, then you have some other arguments. Uh, you have also uh, always a description next to them if you do not uh, understand them. But here you have the start frame, the end frame, and the frames per second, which uh, I think are quite important at the beginning to just set uh, how many frames you want to use for your model. Um, and then the only evaluation is also important. If you put the only evaluation to zero, you will only test your model on the test set. If you set it to one, it will create the JSON file for the challenge set. If you set it to two, it will create for the it will create a JSON file for the test set and the challenge set. And if you set it to three, it's for the training. Uh, then your model will do the training, will check it on the validation set and on the test set uh, for the number of epochs that you have defined here. Um, I can show you an example here. Uh, if you want to test. Uh, uh, our baseline model, you can download the weights on our GitHub, um, which is located here. You just download the weights here and you save them in the VAS model uh, folder. Uh, I already downloaded them, otherwise it would take too much time. As you can see, I have them here. And if you want to test our model on the test set, our baseline model with the pre-trained weight on the test model, what you have to do is you would have just have to run Python main. Then you have to set the pooling type. Here we have the mean, the max, and the tension. At our baseline is the tension uh, pooling. You have to specify a tension. We only take the frame 63 and to uh, 87, and we just take uh, 17 frames per second. The batch size is to one. And here is the pass I have mentioned. So even if we only test it on the test set, we do not give here the uh, test set, but we only give this one here, the pass to the data set and the, and the um, uh, algorithm will automatically go inside the test set. The pre-trained model that we use for our baseline models, uh, model is the MVIT. Then we set it to zero as we only want to test it on the test set and we set uh, the, the, the pass to the weights. Okay, let's run this. Okay, this will now take some time because the model will go uh, over all the test set and it will evaluate and it will uh, make the predictions for each action. So I will just continue and then uh, when it's done, I will come back to it. In the main, um, think there's not much change you have to do. If you want to train a new model, you have to remove this one here and you have to um, specify your own model. You just uh, uh, remove this and you uh, call your own model that you want to test uh, or that you want to train. Uh, otherwise, I don't think there are much changes needed that you have to do uh, in the test uh, in, in the data loader. I think you can uh, enter most of the parameters or the arguments so that you get the data in a way that you want it. Um, yes. Uh, I think for the code, it's very straightforward. If you just, if you want to train your own model, you just have to change this line here and you just have to enter your own model. If you have trained your model and you want to test it on our interface, we have implemented this VAS interface, um, which is if you uh, clone our GitHub, you get this one and you have here the VAS interface. If you go inside it, you have what I have here. You have again to download the weights and to ha you have to save them in the interface folder. I already um, downloaded it because otherwise it takes too long. And if you want to test your model of our baseline, you just run Python main.py. This now takes a second. My laptop isn't the fastest one.
Okay, and now you can see the interface here uh, where you can test your own uh, videos or where you can set test videos with your model of our baseline. If you click open files, uh, you can just open the data set, you load some videos, and then the model will um, make its predictions. I don't have a GPU on my laptop, so it's not uh, very fast, but if you have a GPU, it takes about, I think, um, a second or even less than a second. Here you can see your performance from A or B. I'm thinking now it takes 10 seconds or then it should show you some colors which off point these videos. Uh, I hope this works now. Okay, now it's loading. Okay, and you can see here the, the player from Bayern Munich, Ribéry, is standing here on the foot of the defender and our model correctly predicts that he should receive a yellow card or it is a foul and he should receive a yellow card and that it is uh, a standing tackling which is also the ground truth for this uh, video clip if you want to uh, test your own model here if you go in the interface folder in the, the video window you can here where we load the model you can just replace it with the model that you have trained and load the weights uh, to test your own model finally at the bottom here uh, for, to open the files you have to uh, make some changements depending on uh, how you train the the videos of your model for example we only took the vid uh, the frames between 63 and 87 so i did the same for the interface if you do not do it just remove it um and you just have to ch make some changes here so that the videos that you load are uh, the same or in the same uh, fashion as you did during training otherwise the model will be uh, confused but these are the only two changes that you have to make in the interface to test your model uh, if you have trained it um if we go now back here uh, we can see that the model is done uh, for the test set and it now has created a json file which can be used uh, for the eval ai server which we have, which has now created for each action, uh, his predictions. For example, for the action zero, it predicts is a, a, a tackling. Uh, it's no foul, and as it's no foul, it's also no severity. For the action one, it predicts a challenge, a foul, and a red card. And here we have all the predictions of the model for the test set, and this you can use for the Eval AI server to check uh, how good your model was. I think this is pretty much everything uh, important for the for the code. Um, let me know if there's anything that uh, was not clear. I will uh, I, I will answer it to you. Uh, I just have one last slide. Um, so for the CV Sports uh, workshop at CVPR, we also have a paper which got accepted where we have uh, uh, introduced uh, explainability in football refereeing. So we have implemented an AI model or an AI referee, which cannot only take decisions, but he can, but can also explain why he thinks that it is a foul or a yellow card. We have a small trailer here. This is just a little bit of publicity for our uh, paper that just got accepted. Uh, if you're interested in it, uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn uh, to stay up to date. Um, the, uh, the GitHub, the code is already available, but uh, the weights and the data set will be available soon. So just follow me on LinkedIn to get more up, uh, more information and uh, scan the QR code to get uh, access to or to come to the GitHub of our uh, multi-view foul recognition challenge for this year. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask and uh, or just send me a message uh, on Discord, on LinkedIn or uh, per email. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation, uh, Jan. A very great presentation that we had also from uh, Vladimir and Victor. 
Uh, so thank you very much, uh, guys. Um, so yeah, I will uh, I will just uh, wrap up uh, this uh, SoccerNet uh, tutorial uh, session with uh, just first a few uh, information to let you know that uh, if you need to contact us, there are several uh, media. Uh, so of course, we have our Discord server uh, where it is the, the easiest for us to answer your question, actually. Uh, and otherwise, we are also very active on, on uh, now X, uh, previously Twitter, uh, and all of our um, uh, resources are available on GitHub. Uh, so github.com slash soccernet, where you can find everything, uh, including uh, the new work that Jan uh, just mentioned uh, previously. And so as I told you, this... Um, this uh, live tutorial session will be available on our YouTube channel called ACAD Research. Uh, so make sure to go there. And if you don't want to miss uh, the next uh, videos that we uh, publish, uh, then make sure to subscribe to uh, this channel as well. Now, we can, I think, uh, move on to uh, the, the last part of this SoccerNet tutorial, which is uh, the question part. Um, so I've seen that uh, a lot of you were already very active in the chat. So thank you very much for that. And we'll uh, stop the recording of the session now and head to the questions. Thank you very much uh, for attending this uh, SoccerNet tutorial today. And we hope to see you uh, very soon on our Discord and in the leaderboard of our challenges. Thank you.